You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Hi, I'm Alan Weitz, and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today's topic is cult cameras and why it's getting hard to find a decent used Hasselblad these days. The used photo market is a barometer of what's popular, collectible, durable, and depending on your point of view, cool and fashionable. Today's podcast is going to be an open conversation with photographer and camera collector Jason Wallace, and one of the most knowledgeable, trusted, and personable, and if I'm not mistaken, the tallest member of the B&H used gear department, Chris Kernche. We'll talk about which cameras hold their value, which digital cameras are the new classics, which ones fly off the shelves faster than others. And we're also going to talk a bit about what goes on behind the scenes when it comes to checking out equipment, pricing gear, and what to look for when you're purchasing used cameras, lenses, and whatever else might be in the photo department. Uh, We're also going to talk about trust and reputation, which is really, really also an important part of the game. Chris, let's start with you. Mm-hmm. Who are your customers? I, I know that they're pros, amateur students. We get people from all over the planet here. Um, and how many of these faces are familiar, return customers? Do most of them know what they're looking for, or do they need guidance? Mm, mm, well, that's, a, that's like five questions well, in one. Having done this for about 43 years, I think I've outlived most of my customers <laughs> at this point. But now we have people that I've known for 30 years who come by and say hi. And, uh, and then we have people... Uh, because it is such an international place from all over the world. And the fun thing about that is that you can actually watch trends move around the world because you get reports every day from Argentina, uh, Brazil, uh, Europe, where things are going, where they're moving, and uh, it's pretty exciting. So, yeah, it is educational. I learn every day. That's the most important thing because you can't possibly know everything about every product. So I pick up stuff every day from my customers. Interesting. Mm. Jason, um, <laughs> you, you, you tend to wander around with a lot of eclectic gear. What got you into used gear? What do you look for when you start playing around with stuff? What, what, what strikes your fancy? Well, things I bought new a long time ago, and now they're used in uh, reasonable prices, and particularly items that have been produced in great volume and are awash in the market. How does it affect your shooting? Because I know that you, you, you always have a camera with you. Uh, it, it's, not a, it's not unusual to see Jason walking around with an RB67 with a prism around his neck, which I find impressive by itself. Listen to that shutter go off. There you go. Seismic uh, meters just went off in California from that thing. Uh. <laughs> the physics, the physical <laughs> presence of it as a six-pound camera encourages uh, a slower, more con contemplative uh, process and I enjoy that. I've done uh, breaking news, uh, public relations, weddings, so forth uh, at high speed and this is not for that. But this is what I like to do at the pace I like to do it. Yeah, well there's also a people aspect to this because if you're walking down the street with an RB67 which is about, I don't know, three, four pounds, people come up and start talking to you. They're, They're fascinated. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what a lot of this is all about now. People are rediscovering the patina, the look, the feel, the sound of all this stuff. Uh, not just mass-produced plastic items and electronic items, which are very efficient, but kind of distant. So it's, it's fun to watch people who are attached to their own equipment and how it brings in other people uh, as part of the conversation as well. One of the cameras that I bought here at b thank you, Chris, uh, was an Olympus O product, which I actually have with me here today. And it's, for those of you who have never seen it, go Google Olympus O product. It was made back in the 80s. It's a simple point-and-shoot camera with a fixed 35 millimeter lens. But it looks like something, at, it's very retro, very 30s. Uh, it, it has a look as if some lunatic went into an aluminum shop and built a camera that's bright, shiny aluminum. Now, what's funny about it, the camera itself is very, very simple and basic. There's nothing high-tech about it. It has autofocus and a meter. But people look at it, and they stop, and they talk to you. And I find that if I'm going to a, a party or a family gathering, I take this with me, and the pictures that I get out of it are wonderful because people say, that's a camera? 
sometimes I'll goof on and I'll actually hold it up and I'll start talking to it as if it's a phone, which is actually a lot of fun. Cool. Uh, but I find that the pictures I get with this camera are really good because people are thrilled that this goofy camera really works and that they're having their picture taken. Hmm, absolutely true. You know, when you pick up a camera, and that's why when a customer comes in, the most important thing you can do is say, well, what's your intention? You know, somebody says medium format. Well, that's like saying automobile. So you have to take it through a process of, well, what's your intention? Are you going to be doing portraits in a studio situation, landscapes, repetage? So a Roliflex twin lens, or Yashica for that matter, is going to be operated and be assessed by the subject differently than um, a Hasselblad, which is a modular medium format camera. It's just noisier, bigger, bigger, clunkier, and it has a different response uh, when you use a different product. So you want to get the right tool, and that's why it's important to, to you know, go through that process. One of the things I noticed is that if I walked into the used department three years ago, two and a half years ago, there were a lot of Hasselblads on the shelf mm. of all different types. Yeah. Now I walk in there and there are very few of them. Yeah. You know, it's been an interesting dynamic and I don't want to say, um, you know, Nostradamus, but I said about five or six years ago, I said, people are going to get inundated with electronic imaging and they're going to look for something different. And the different thing generally would be some type of film camera. And over the last three or four years, it's been a building swell of uh, demand for uh, film type products. Now the Hasselblad being the star of the show gets a lot of the social media talk. So as we started to ramp up, people talking about film photography, uh, a lot of this is shared on social media. And I've noticed that specific items, Hasselblad, Roliflex, premium stuff, Leica, get sucked up first. People love this stuff and it's great. So, yeah, we cannot supply demand now. That's how, how, how much it's grown after the last two and a half, three years. Now, you, you use the film word a few times. And when you buy these cameras, specifically a, a Hasselblad or a Mamiya with an intentional back, we now have relatively affordable digital backs to go along with many of these cameras, including your RB. Uh, if you if you really wanted to talk about eclectic, an RB67 with a digital back, that's pretty eclectic. Uh, but it's possible and it's doable. So we're not only talking film here, we are talking digital. And and while I have the word digital on my mind, what about digital? I know that we think used department, you think film. But the truth is we have a lot of digital cameras that are also here right now mm -hmm. uh, in the used department. And, and there are advantages to that too because, uh, as, as we all know, digital ca cameras come out far more frequently than we want to admit sometimes. I know the Nikon F3 film camera was produced for 26 years relatively unchanged. Right. Now, three years is a long time for a cycle of any camera before it's a, a new replacement camera comes out. Now, it doesn't mean that the one it's replacing it is suddenly not a good camera. The other one, the new one, might do things better and usually does, but not always. But I think there's some advantages right now also if, you, if you're on a budget or you're a student or you say you're you're doing something experimental and you don't want to destroy something that cost five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars, or even three thousand dollars or two thousand dollars. There are some good digital alternatives out there too. So, how many people are coming in looking for digital cameras? Is it much as film, or or is it equal, less, more? Oh no, I mean the big mover is digital, and there's so much interest, there's so much new product, mirrorless cameras and DSLRs and point and shoots and stuff. Although uh, a good phone is knocking off a lot of the snapshot business. Um, but a funny story, uh, one of my customers who I've known for 30 years came in yesterday and he bought maybe his 15th Nikon D200, which is maybe an eight year old camera now. And it cost $219 and, and it was mint condition and it does exactly what he wants. And that's why he buys them. And then of course we have the latest technology. We have DA10s. Uh, you know, if you can save money, uh, at, you know, 500, a thousand dollars on a, on a package, Hey, that's what people want to do. And people know that there's a shelf life. They'll keep the camera for a year or two, you know, maybe longer. But basically, you flip out before, you know, you, you go into a catastrophic uh, financial nosedive. And that happens with electronics in general. So, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jason, I, I know that usually you shoot film. Digital also? Are you, are you still shooting digital? Oh, sure. For, for uh, color. 
Uh, I was a custom printer in a color lab, and I, I know analog color printing well enough to appreciate not doing it. <laughs> uh, much prefer to do it electronically. You can make nonlinear edits that we dreamed of that we used masks to make sort of uh, in the film world and still couldn't match the flexibility and the re- reversibility of electronic uh, editing. I know. I see what you walk around with as far as older classic film cameras. What about digital? I, I, have you gone into any of things? Is there like anything to, you've bought? I like to buy uh, pro digital cameras, Canon uh, 1DS series, uh, several years behind because the price plummets. Yeah. And you can still get uh, professional performance that's very usable today. Yeah, there's one bit of advice, though. That's what I would tell my customers, you know, value shoppers, people who are interested in buying stuff. Uh, yeah, if you go one or two generations back, you're getting a phenomenal camera at a sometimes a third of the price it was selling brand new. So a $2,000 camera could be six, $700. That's commonplace now. That money you save, you can put into a better lens, which is really what it's all about, ultimately, getting good glass and a good, good sensor. I'd also imagine that with the advent of mirrorless cameras, that's also changed the used market a lot as far as what people are looking for and shopping for. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's, it's, it's funny how expectations are created. Now, we have a, you know, every major manufacturer, well, not everyone, but uh, you know, a lot of the manufacturers make them. But then you see people put these big lenses on uh, these little bodies. And, you know, so part of what I've learned is that, you know, when a customer comes in, you counsel them. You go, well, what, what's your goal? Are you going to do sports or nature where you're going to put a big, uh, you know, super telephoto or zoom on it? And I said, well, maybe you should consider, a, you know, maybe a more compact uh, DSLR. So, again, everything has a place. And, you know, part of the job here at b and is really to, to help the customer through the process. And, uh, yeah, it has changed. You know, let's face it. Who, who wants to walk around with four or five pounds of camera equipment when you can do a pound or pound and a half in a little bag? It's phenomenal. Right. It's a like esque concept, which is what, what I really like about it. Speaking about Leica, one of the things I noticed um, is that for a long time, Leica is known as rangefinders and uh, predominantly the M-series cameras, but they also made some extremely good reflex cameras that were discontinued, film cameras. Mm-hmm. And the lenses that were made for these cameras were really excellent. And for the longest time, you could buy them by the pound because the cameras were gone. Everyone went digital. And we have all of these wonderful lenses sitting on the shelves that you could buy for peanuts. Now with mirrorless cameras and an adapter, and most ad- uh, adapter manufacturers are making like our adapters to go with pretty much all of the cameras that are out there. These prices are now going up. And a lot of people are saying, hey, I could have some really – excellent glass for any camera that I own, even if I switch from one brand to another from time to time, all I need is an adapter and now I could take my lenses with me. And I think it's an important thing. If you look at what's available for lenses right now, and I know that I've, I, I, I can't walk into the store without stopping <laughs> at the sales counter and just looking to see what's there and used. And, you know, I'm a sucker for these things and I often end up buying things. Uh, Chris, you're going to pay you, for this. You're someday. one of our best customers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Me but, too. <laughs> I think we're all guilty of that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think that that's also an important thing for uh, a, a beginner and even a pro, somebody who's been shooting for a while. There, there are some really wonderful, I hate to say bargains, but you, you could save money and get some really very, very good equipment mm-hmm. by shopping in the used. And again, you're not stuck into one particular. If you own a Nikon or a Sony or a Pentax or Canon, whatever, you're not lo- locked into any one brand. I think it's an important note uh, for these kind of things. Well, you know, Canon, you know, with the DSLR video aspect of it, really is what got this thing going, uh, you know, on the 5D Mark II. Mm-hmm. And uh, then all of a sudden, all the premium glass Zeiss or Leica, Nikkors, were being utilized more because a manual lens, in many cases, is a lot easier to do, use for videography right. and, 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 and control. So that ignited the market. Now, of course, we've got a, a whole new era of mirrorless compact cameras where it's reignited again. So the demand, once again, for practical reasons or aesthetic reasons or whatever, 
is really going off the charts. So it's hard to keep up with it. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. So now that we're all going out and buying used cameras and lenses and bodies and things that here's an important thing. What are we looking for? What kind of things should you check for? Uh, um, Jason, I know you're out there all the time. You pick up a camera body, you pick up a lens. What are the things that you're looking for? Because again, you're buying something and you don't know who used it before. You don't know what they used it for. There's all kinds of surprise. I, I just off the cuff, I used to do a lot of yachting photography. And I remember I once went into a camera store to trade in some stuff. And for somehow the guy put it to his nose and he goes, it smells like salt water. <laughs> he has no idea how much he's salt good. Is he's good. But but yeah, you know, I mean, and obviously, I mean, if you open up the, if you look carefully, you could see oxidation was going on, all kinds of funny green, coppery colors and stuff. But what what are the sort of things that you should look for? And I'll put this out to both of you right now. I I, I know the things that I would check, but things that you have to do right off the bat. Say with the camera body, what are the things you look for? I check for uh, areas of a given camera that I know fail easily, like the rotating back on an RB. Okay. Yeah, I'll turn it and feel it and see if the um, interlock catch will stick in between positions. Uh, things I've had happen to me. And if they're used really hard, it'll happen more. Take them apart, look inside, see if the flocking is falling off. The fine flocking. Yes. I know what you're talking about, but what yes. are you talking what, what is that? The uh, anti-reflection coatings on the inside of the camera. If it's used really hard or it's been in heat, it'll come off and drop onto the mirror and be loose inside the camera. Mm -hmm. It's a sign of heavy use. Also, the film advance is something. If it's if it's in advance, you check on that. If the it's a film camera, in the advance. you look at wear on the pressure plate and the film tracks, things of that sort. Um, I know something that I've always checked for, if it's a mechanical camera with, with a mechanical shutter, shutter speeds. Mm -hmm. The, the mid-range speeds tend to stay fairly accurate, but you should listen to one second, half second, quarter second. You know, e even the high-end sh uh, shutter speeds, those are harder to detect. But chances are if you're slower speeds, if one second is, is goes by a little bit quicker than a second, you know you have a problem mm -hmm. there. How has eBay changed the used department? I, I know we all go on there and bought it, but ha has it changed the used market that much? Well, it's not as wild and woolly as it used to be. Uh, mm, good point. There are occasionally grossly inflated prices, and I usually check a reference, uh, something like keh.com, that has fairly conservative grades and uh, reasonable prices and compare it. If I find something that appears to be the same grade but it's much higher in price, I'll move on. I, I personally noticed that there are some dealers that will just put something at ridiculous prices, and it they go they're there forever. They don't care if it sells, it sells. If not, it's it's it doesn't matter anymore. So, it, yeah, it has changed a lot. Well, it's it's the access to information now. It's not just your local newspaper. Now the classifieds were the same thing. Yeah, you know, I mean, you could go to a dealer and buy a car, or whatever, a camera, or you can go to the classifieds, and there were always. Uh, like a Shutterbug newspaper or, or, or it used to be bylines. They used to advertise camera equipment in the bylines. I don't think they could even exist anymore. But listen, buyer beware. That's what it comes down to. And today we're just inundated with a lot more information, a lot more product, and it's coming from Japan, it's coming from Germany, it's coming from South America uh, and the United States. So, you know, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's like the, the, the classified newspaper shopper versus somebody who wants the comfort and support of going to a established dealership who shops prices and comes up with a consensus price that's, you know, appealing because there's guarantees and returns and, and the camera's been checked out. So it's... Uh, Good it's, point. But you said that camera's been checked out. Now, one thing I know about b and is that we do check out cameras that come through here. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, yeah, I mean, it would be suicide business in just business sense to just grab a camera from somebody and throw it on the shelf and then watch it explode in the customer's hands. You don't want to do that. So <laughs> we, we actually, yeah, we have a whole trade and procedure, you know, testing machines. We have a technician, uh, actually two technicians in-house who can service a lot of our own product if there's an issue. And uh, we don't take outside work in. But it's there is part of the support to make sure the customer is not going to get annoyed 
by something that had been overlooked. And it does happen once in a while, to be honest with you. I, I know it was one thing that uh, it was a few years ago. It might have been on DP Review. Uh, somebody bought a camera, a digital camera from B&H, and a memory card was in it. And they took it out and opened up files. And it was pictures of the technicians we have here checking out the cameras. It was, and they ran some of the pictures. But there you go. You know, <laughs> they busted us. We check out cameras before we sell them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think any reputable business knows that the support staff – not just winging it, and that's what that's what happens with a lot of dealerships, uh, is the way to grow, and uh, you know, and that's what customers like, you know, for the most part. I mean, you, al you always have bargain hunters, but we listen. We have our, our uh, there's many times when our prices are cheaper than than what's on eBay or the other auction sites. So you know, it, it goes both ways. And you have a warranty, and you have a backup, and you have somebody to talk to if something exactly. goes south. If yeah. something goes yeah. south, what, what about our? What about our international market? We're right here in the middle of New York City, and, and obviously we have a lot of people walking in, but I, I know that whenever I'm in the store, invariably I hear a lot of different languages going on. Yeah, it's, it's funny watching trends go around the world. For example, in Europe five or six years ago, nobody was talking film at all. And I was saying, gee, when is it going to start to move over there? And now it's it's a big part of the request. Everybody's looking for a, a Nikon F or a lenses for. So it's it, you can actually watch information move around the world and watch the, the populations uh, respond. It's it's really amazing because you have a, 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 a first-hand barometer of what's going on in that store. To go back to buying used gear, we spoke about camera bodies. Uh, lenses, that's something that is also important. I know one of the first things that I do is look through the barrel. Is there fungus in it? Is there fogging? Um, is there excessive dust? And by the way, I think it's important to, say, to, to qualify dust that a few specks of dust do not do anything to your picture quality. Mm -hmm. It's invisible. If you see a couple of specks, don't even a little glass bubble sometimes you'll find. It's nothing. It does not affect the image quality. That is a minor, minor aspect that never, ever shows up. However, barrel wobble, is it smooth? Does the aperture ring, assuming your lens even has an aperture ring, dual lenses don't have that. Is it smooth? Is it click? Do the, di do the diaphragm blades close down to the same shape and size each time it stops down at each given aperture? Because if you set the lens, say, to f8 or f11 and you stop it down repeatedly and it comes out to a different size and shape each time, you've got a problem. That's going to be uneven exposure. That's going to be – it's going to change the bokeh, look of the, of, of the out-of-focus specular highlights. Um, does it focus to infinity? A lot of little things like that. What about, you, you buy a lot of used stuff. What, what are some of the things that you look for? I look for, for oil on aperture blades. Yep. I uh, listen to all the shutter speeds if there's a built-in shutter. I'll feel the focusing helicoid. I'll tolerate some specks of dust within the optical system if they're black. Black dust, any bits of flocking mm -hmm. don't show. When it's, okay. when it's bright, when it's white... Uh, it shows more if you're looking at a dark subject at that very position. You can see some interference, but if it's a black speck, almost never will it show. I think another thing also, if the a reflex camera with a mirror, there's always some kind of a foam or a padding. Make sure that stuff is not disintegrating because that fills up. Now, that's easy to repair, by the way, and replace. It's not a it's not a major issue. But if it is falling apart, it's getting into the mirror chamber, and that could be more issues. Sticking bigger to the problems. mirror. I want to make make a point about uh, you know we, we seem to be gravitating toward the classic lenses and so on and so forth. Uh, but today's modern lenses, used or, or or new, have a tendency to be wobbly anyway. So these are all things. If you come in looking for a 75 to 300 zoom for your Nikon or Canon, uh, I mean, if you're looking around, uh, you know, a lot of these lenses, the autofocus lenses, are built in with a, a, some amount of play. That's true. So, Very true. So you have to know what's considered normal or what's excessive. Within reason. Exactly. What's within and reason. And you have a lot more complexity. You have stabilization systems now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, you know, you got to be on your game. Obviously, 
but if you have a digital camera, you can check the, the and that's the, the other great thing about digital photography is that you can see the image immediately. So if something looks bad, then you know you've got something bad unless you're really bad about holding a camera steady or something like that. But that's, that's a very good point. Film camera, you don't know what you have until you put film through it and get it back. Whereas with digital, yeah, it's, it's, it's just feedback. like the pictures are instant. There's your feedback. Is it good? Is it working? That's a very, very good point. So you could do a lot of checking in the store or right up front before, without having to go through too much trouble. I mean, the worst thing you want to do is buy a camera and go out on a vacation or do, go to any kind of an event that's, that's going to be irreplaceable and find out that you got a turkey. Uh, you just don't want that. That's the last thing you want. Mm, it happens even with new lenses. I mean, sure. I'll be honest with you, there's a certain small percentage that – but again, part of it is if you're an experienced photographer and experienced with a lot of equipment – uh, yeah, you could you could kind of if you're looking privately to buy stuff, uh, you know, you can you know may be able to avoid problems. But you know, again, dealing with a reputable dealership, that's all done for you, and uh, you know that saves a lot of time, effort, aggravation, and uh, you know countless uh, dollars. And uh, yeah, good point. Um, for anybody who's looking, this is one of those little oddball things for checking out. If you're ever looking for a twin lens reflex camera, something you could check, something you should check is when you focus a twin lens reflex, the two the lenses go back and forth from the camera body. And when you come to infinity, the entire lens board should come to rest evenly if the top or bottom mm -hmm. or left or right side reaches the camera body and one of the surfaces isn't, that camera has most likely been dropped and you're not getting a, a true focus. You're not getting an accurate focus and you may not be getting infinity. So that just for, that's a very specific thing for a twin lens camera. You always should check that out. I know I recently saw one that somebody said they had a beautiful camera. It was Roloflex. It was beautiful. It, did, it was not true though. Mm -hmm. And the person who bought it said, you know, I didn't see that. And they brought it back. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a million things. It's like taking a watch apart, you know. That's how a lot of these cameras are. I don't recommend so, taking watches apart. Or cameras, <laughs> because there's a lot of little things in there. So, but yeah, that's why you want people to make sure everything's working properly beforehand. So that's my advice. Um, Jason, you've been buying and using a lot of used gear for a long time now. Do you depend on specific dealers or people? Are there certain people you go to? And, and how do you judge... The source of your gear, because there has to be a certain amount of trust there. Well, yes, uh, keh.com. I've used before they were .com uh, when I was a teenager, and that was a long time ago. So I, I use them as a reference. I I buy things I don't want to gamble on from them directly. I've been in this uh, line of work for so long that what used to be a uh, bricks and mortar situation is now morphed into a dot com. So there are lots and lots of old time reputable dealers who go on uh, who are on on the internet now because that's how you reach your your your, uh, your customers and new customers, you know. What about selling gear? Uh, I'm a photographer and I have gear I want to sell. Um, I, J and Jason, I'm sure you have plenty of stuff that you've bought and sold also. What do you look for? What, what can you expect as far as return on these items? Well, I, I take into mind uh, how much money I've made with them, for one thing, mm -hmm. and how much uh, relative value is left in, an, in the item. And uh, particularly if I haven't used it for five years, I'll move it on. It's good to move on. If you hold on to any electronic item too long, it's going to depreciate down to virtually nothing within three or four years. Well, this is a terrific episode. Um, thank you, Jason and Chris and John, our producer, and Jason, our engineer. We have dual Jasons here. I think this is a unique. I, we never had that happen uh, before. For more photo news and reviews, check bh.com slash explorer. Follow us on Twitter at bhphotovideo and email your questions to podcast at bhphoto.com. My name is Alan Weitz. Thank you so much for tuning in today. <laughs>